Bonjour, hello, welcome, good afternoon. Thanks for being here with us this afternoon in this cold, increasingly cold weather. Uh, my name is Daniel Bellan. I'm the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. I would like to begin by acknowledging that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. It is important to us at MISC to recognize the significance of the land on which we work, study and live, and to acknowledge the complex web of relationships of which we are a part. We encourage everyone here today to seek out more spaces for learning and understanding the history of these territories. The McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, which is known as MISC, uh, is the Center for Canadian uh, and uh, Quebec and Indigenous Studies programs at McGill University. MISC supports a multidisciplinary approach to the study of Canada by bringing together students, researchers, and practitioners to discuss the important issues about the country's past, present, and future. In addition to our academic programs, MISC also hosts public events such as the one uh, today. Uh, really, we focus on a, a wide range of topics and issues that are important to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. And if you want to learn more about MISC and about our activities, you can visit our website, which is mcgill.ca slash MISC. Uh, we are pleased uh, today to host um, this event as part of McGill's Black History Month programming. Thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, important discussion. This is really a, a timely and important topic. And today I will just introduce our wonderful moderator here, who is a, a former uh, a student actually tied to MISC at the undergrad level. Uh, um, and we're always glad to see our students come back, uh, return uh, to us. Uh, um, and. Uh, Holly uh, Cabrera uh, is a digital journalist based in Montreal, where she has been covering news of local and national interest for the CBC since 2020. Last year, her reporting in the multi-platform project Saving Chinatown was honored uh, by RTDNA Canada in the enterprise journalism category. She holds an undergrad degree uh, from McGill and a master's degree in information studies, also from McGill uh, University. So we are really glad to have you here, Holly, and you will introduce our three wonderful panelists. So it's all you. Thank you. Merci, Danielle, and thank you to all of you for being here with us this evening, and also thanks to those who are joining us online. It's truly a privilege to discuss anti-black racism in Canada and beyond, especially as an event for an institution called McGill University. At the same time, I have to admit that I wish we still didn't have to speak about anti-black racism today, if only our lives didn't depend on addressing the societal issue. After all, we're holding this round table nearly a week after the city of Memphis released videos of police beating Tyrese Nichols before he died in hospital. And a little over a month ago, in the city of Montreal, Nikis DeAndre Spring died after being legally detained. You'll recall that many have referred to 2020 as a moment of racial reckoning. And since police murdered George Floyd, we've seen more beatings, more book clubs, and more backlash. So it bears repeating, anti-black racism has existed for centuries, and black people continue to resist it. So to help us unpack the pervasiveness of anti-black racism, from microaggressions to systemic discrimination, allow me to introduce our esteemed speakers. Tari Ajadi is an assistant professor in black politics at McGill University. His research analyzes how black activists in mid-sized cities in Canada strategize to prompt change in policing and in health policy. A British Nigerian immigrant to Canada, Tari aims to produce research that supports and engages with black communities across the country. He's a board member with the East Coast Prison Justice Society and a co-author of the Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM report released in January 2022. 
David Austin is the author of Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Questy Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution, as well as Fear of a Black Nation, winner of the 2014 Casas de las Americas Prize. He's the editor of Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers and the Making of Global Consciousness, as well as You Don't Play with Revolution, the Montreal Lectures of CLR James. David also produced documentaries on CLR James and France Fanon for CBC's Ideas. He currently teaches in the Humanities, Philosophy, and Religion Department at John Abbott College and in the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. And last but not least, Terry Gibbons is a professor of political science and the provost academic lead and advisor on McGill's strategy to address anti-black racism. She has conducted research since the late 1990s on the politics of immigration and race in Europe. And she is most recently the author of The Roots of Racism, The Politics of White Supremacy in the US and Europe, as well as Radical Empathy, Finding a Path to Bridging Racial Divides. So we'll have about an hour for the moderated discussion and then we'll open the floor to your questions. So to start, um, I'd just like to ask a general question. Um, could you define what anti-black racism is and tell us how it operates? Maybe, Terry, you could start us off. Each person can stop, start. <laughs> um, so, you know, anti-black racism for me goes back, of course, as we, we've already mentioned, hundreds of years. And actually the creation of race, you know, goes back hundreds of years. And the fact that it was connected to the slave trade. Um, and the reason I wrote my book, The Roots of Racism, is to ha have a way to trace that up to the present. How has race become part of our politics? And how that is a transatlantic phenomenon. So we have to keep in mind, and actually it's, it's interesting, we have representation here. I'm from the US. We have uh, Britain and Nigeria and Canada, but also the Caribbean is, is you know, influences here as well. And all of those are tied together. And so I think one of the things I like to emphasize is anti-black racism is not specific to um, the US or Canada, it, but it's, it's, trans, it's transatlantic, it's transnational, and it goes back in history because in order to dehumanize Africans who were enslaved, they had to create a new race, which was black people. <laughs> And, or people of African descent. And so that is a persistent thing that has, you know, as I try to show throughout history, and it's tied to immigration from the perspective of the fact that if you go back, you know, both Canada and the US had, uh, you know, whites only pretty much immigration policies until the 1960s. Um, you know, Europe is struggling with, uh, you know, immigration today and has been for a long time. But, um, you know, there's this conflation of immigration and race that happens when you look at policies that are designed to keep certain types of people out, um, that are designed to, within countries, to keep people from voting or, or from having equal rights. Um, and you know the reason I'm at McGill today is because if you go back a few years ago, we, we only had 10 black faculty out of 1,700. And you know, and after the summer of 2020, McGill, you know, they realized that had to change. And so I agreed to come to help change that those numbers. And you know, I'm happy to say we've been able to bring in new colleagues like, like Tari and David's been around for a while, but. You know, we have had, you know, that these systems and that impact is longstanding and has to be very actively dealt with in order to create change. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak, and thanks, Terry, because that sets me up pretty perfectly for what I was going to say, which is that, you know, when we're thinking about anti-black racism, it's this global system, right? It, as you mentioned, it's a global system that's dependent on dominance and on capital, right? So at the end of the day, it's not simply about the dehumanization, but it's about the dehumanization for a particular purpose, and that is the acquisition of capital, the acquisition of resources, right? And this, these resources have been used to number one, hoard wealth, and number two, starve, dehumanize, and alienate people of African descent, people who are 
do not have access to these means of production, right? And so I think that it's really important that we also bring in that perspective and that analysis into this conversation, right? I also think that in the construction of these races via racism, we've got to remember that this dehumanization impacts everyone that it touches. So anti-black racism dehumanizes white people, right? Like it, 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 it removes your humanity, it removes your agency because things are being done perhaps in your name and often to your benefit, whether or not you are aware of it or not, that limit and constrict your own humanity. And so I think it's so important that we recognize that anti-black racism is a global problem. And when I say global, I don't just mean that it is in different nations, I mean that it affects all of us. It is a problem for all of us. David? Well, I think I'll just echo much of what has just, just been said and that um, this thing we, we now call anti-black racism is, is rooted in the racial codes that were a constituent part of the institution of slavery. And the institution of slavery was a constituent and constitutive part of this thing we call capitalism, which was also tied to colonialism. So I absolutely agree with what um, Tari just said. But you know, in the afterlife, in the sort of post-emancipation world, but in a world of unfreedom, it's tied to our human day-to-day -day encounters in ways that eclipse life possibilities, is tied to employment, is tied to education, is tied to the high rates of incarceration of black folks, and affects our human encounters in ways that eclipse human freedom and the prospects for human solidarity, and, and I would say more importantly, common cause, right? So in that sense, it absolutely, you know, there's a way in which anti-black racism is, is discussed as though it only shapes and influences the lives of black folks, right? But it's a constituent part of our human encounters as human beings, I would add. And thank you for drawing attention to the fact that it really does affect everyone. Um, clearly, following 2020, there's been a important interest in um, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, Terry, you kind of touched on that uh, earlier. Um, at the same time, while there are many well-meaning initiatives, some actions have been performative. And I'd like to ask all of you, how can we as members of these institutions engage with them? How can we prevent them from, I suppose, masking or maintaining uh, white hegemony? Because um, that is obviously what um, individuals are up against, whether they're from marginalized groups or not. David, <laughs> you have the best facial expression. I, I've been volunteered, okay. Um, you know, representation is important, and there are ways in which people of African descent alongside indigenous peoples and other marginalized groups have been historically excluded from institutions like McGill. You know, when I was an undergraduate at McGill, there were maybe less than a handful of black, black professors that you couldn't count on, and, and many of them were just sort of transient, even graduate students. Um, so it's possible that numbers can, can change, but you know, it's important to talk about race and racism in structural ways, right? Because that's the only way we can actually understand what happened in Memphis. Right, and we, you know, and, and of course, there's a lot of conversation around well, the officers were black, et cetera. But that's not the point. We're talking about structural power, and how even with representation of more black faces in high places, if the structures of power do not trans are not transformed, right, the same patterns of behavior are reproduced, regardless of what faces are in place, right. And when we kind of translate that into other institutional forms having more 
people of African descent in the institutions like McGill, the university, it's, it's profoundly important. It's profoundly important for the students. It's profoundly important for the academic environment in terms of what ideas are exchanged, right? Which is not to reduce people of African descent as academics and professors to only talking about issues that relate to their historical or cultural experiences, not to make that point. But, you know, we can still have more black faces in, in institutions, right? And still have patterns and structures of inequality is my point, right? So we have to think about how the significance and importance of changing the structures, right? And to think about institutions or sites of institutions, universities, as sites that reproduce patterns of freedom and not patterns of inequality. And that's tied to what's taught inside the classrooms, yes, but it's also taught tied to how, you know, kind of hierarchical structures that are patterned on the forms of inequality that exist outside of institutions. Right? So um, EDI in that sense and dealing with representation is one part of the equation, but it's not the complete puzzle. It's far from it, actually. Uh, I would just like to add on to that, because I, I agree totally, that I think that we have to be careful when we're thinking about how far we think EDI initiatives will go and what work we're asking them to do. EDI is a tool of management. It helps you to make your organizations better. That's not liberation, right? Like, <laughs> that's not what liberation looks like to me. That's not what structural change looks like to me. It looks like changing the organization so that the organization achieves its goals in a more efficient or effective way. That's a really valuable thing sometimes, or maybe it's not, but it's not liberation. And I think that what's happened is there is this, there's been this kind of, well, what you could call an inertia, a policy inertia, where we think that representation means that it's going to do something more fundamental or more substantive than it does, right? If there are more black people in an institution, then there are more black people in the institution. That doesn't necessarily designate what they're going to do when they are there, right? And it doesn't help us to sh reshape and reorient our energies towards fighting for liberation. If we're going to fight for liberation, we need to do that. We need to build organizations, political and social organizations, for that purpose. We can't expect organizations that do not exist for that purpose to do that work for us, because that's not, that's not what they're set up to do. They're never going to do it, and we shouldn't entrust our labor, our energy, and our time in trying to make them something that they're not. So, Again, that's not to decry EDI efforts, it's to say that they play a role. They play a particular role in a very particular sense to help us do particular things. But let's not make it broader than what it is or what it needs to be. That's my response. Um, I would come back to what David said earlier about we all have to, it's, it impacts all of us. So, you know, part of the reason I wrote my book, Radical Empathy, is because we, if we don't understand that it impacts all of us, then you know we can't get people to. I'm running into this as you know even now in the work that I'm doing, people don't want to take responsibility, right? It, it, you can tell them over and over that it's systematic, that it, we we are all you know part of you know the whole system of structural discrimination, and if we don't take a step back and look at our own lives and say, you know, where where am I? a part of this system? How have I been impacted by this system? I had to do that for myself. Um, you know, I had to get a better understanding of, you know, why my parents made the choices they did, how I ended up where I am, and the ways that structural discrimination impacted me, and the ways that I was reproducing structural discrimination. And so we all have to do that in order to understand how we can create change. So I, you know, I talk about the fact that we have to be willing to be vulnerable. I had to be willing to be vulnerable to look at you know, the life that I had led up to that point and say, you know, how, am I, how have I internalized the oppression? And how, is, how did my parents internalize that oppression? And how did that impact me? And so I really believe change cannot come about until we all are having, willing to have that vulnerability and say, I am a part of this system. Nobody wants to admit that they are part of a racist system, but we are. <laughs> and you know, so we, I really believe that to, to create that structural change that we're talking about, we really have to get people to take a look and say, 
I have to be willing to admit that the structures I am working in are you know, structurally discriminatory, not just towards blacks, but towards all kinds of people. And that it's you know, basically part of the structures of white supremacy that are built into the system of capitalism that we live in today. It's not from, you know, it, the other thing I noticed a lot of times, people on OS 50 years ago, you know, all, that was, that's old news. No, it's today. And I mean, obviously, with the, you know, we, in the news and, and so on. So, um, you know, I think people want to say, oh, we've made progress. So, you know, we're, we're good. We, we've, we've got enough black students at McGill. It's like, no, <laughs> we, we don't, number one. And number two, that's not the point. The point is have we created an environment where students want to come to McGill, where black faculty feel like they belong and can thrive and flourish? Have we created an environment that makes McGill look like a place people want to be, period. If I, could just, if I could just add to both points in a sense. So the idea of having more black faces in high places, as important as it is, and it's just, it's just to kind of build on what, what Tari said, is, 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 is one thing. And we've been using the word, I mean, each one of us has mentioned the word capitalism at least once. And I think it's important that we name what we're talking about because, you know, we're at a point in the world that we're living in, right? Where we talk in terms of talking about the environment, you know, socioeconomic questions in terms of, you know, climate catastrophe and all of these things which are tied to economics, right? So, you know, what kind of, this raises the question of what kind of world we want to live in beyond simply, you know, thinking about identity in a very kind of limited way, but although important way, because of the ways in which we have been, ex people of African descent have been excluded, right? But that inclusion is part and parcel, hopefully it will be, and I think this is what Tari is saying, part of a bigger conversation about what kind of world we want to live in and what does freedom look like for everybody, including the planet, right? right? Um, that we, have this profound and deeply negative impact on. So it, we need to do the two things at the same time. We need to be able to talk about you know, what representation looks like, but also you know, how it sounds inside the classroom in terms of what is being taught. Right? And, 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 and what potentially is the responsibility or the role that for those of us who teach inside the classroom can have in participating in the creation of that world, right? As opposed to what else might be taught inside the classroom, right? Because we, you know, we've sort of been saturated with this notion that education is neutral, but how can education and ideas be neutral in a world that's going in the direction that it's going in, right? So part of it involves in ba abandoning that conception of what an education um, looks like, I think. Thank you, David. Um, actually. I just wanted to um, go back to your point on education to, especially in Quebec, um, the term or the notion of systemic racism is quite contested. Um, I'd like you to try to take a stab at why that is. Why is it so difficult um, to understand, do you think, um, for some people, uh, the notion of meritocracy not really being a uh, meritocracy? <laughs> Okay, so there are two distinct answers I can give to this. There's a kind of very placid answer, which is that people like to be the protagonists in their own story. And so when you are the protagonist in your own story, you like to believe that everything that you've achieved and everything that you've done has been on your own merit, right? And so there's a, there's a value for those people in thinking about the world that they live in as a simple kind of zero sum game where they've achieved certain things or if they haven't achieved certain things and they, they have a measure of control over, the, over that aspect of things, right? So if I subscribe to something or if I do something or if I achieve something, it is on my own back. We can, we can all probably understand where I stand on that point, but that would be the basis of this idea of meritocracy versus quote unquote systemic racism. But then there's this other thing that happens, right? Where we have what you might call a discursive move to innocence, where 
there is a enforced naivete amongst those that would be provocateurs talking about systemic racism. There's a perception perhaps that like we can we can say certain things or ask certain questions that would elide the fact that we have an agenda by questioning what systemic racism is. They're allowed to do that. This is politics, right? This is politics. They're making a political point. The point is how are we countering that? Right? Like, like we, <laughs> why are we taking this so seriously? It's not an edict. It's not written by God. It's a statement from a political actor. We can counteract that political statement, right? And even though that political actor has power, that does not mean that they, ha they are correct. We have books. We can read. Google is free. <laughs> Google is free, right? Like, we don't need to keep retreading this terrain of, of these conversations with people that are obviously nefarious actors that obviously obviously trying to get a rise out of people so i just i'm like yeah of course you're going to say that that that's fine that's your prerogative you're making a political point i disagree with that point let's move on on that note <laughs> um to go back to the idea of re-envisioning the world um i want to talk about policing of course, um, the Montreal police um, has just received an important increase, $63 million. Um, now it's going to have a budget of $787 million. Um, uh, the Canadian press has also reported that the number of police shootings in Canada has increased by 25% this year, um, including 46 fatal police shootings. Also, um, Terry, uh, you touched on earlier about um, internalized racism. Of course, the fascination with what happened um, to uh, Tyree Nichols in Memphis, the idea that the five police officers were black repeatedly comes up. But my question to you is, given black communities' histories with policing, is policing salvageable? Is it worth, is it even possible <laughs> to reconcile, um, I guess? I'll, I'll start with a broad point and then I'll pass it over to folks who this is more their area. But I mean, to, to give a broader perspective on it is, you know, you look at the where policing came from historically, you know, and the the trend it has taken, um, you know, it's it's a system that I think is just utterly broken. And I say this, you know, having worked with I, I was living in Menlo Park before I came in California, before I came uh, to McGill, and I worked with the police department there for a year. And even though they had a really good-hearted police chief, he had really, you know, the department itself had people in it who were just, you know, incorrigible, who were, you know, and he knew it, and he was hoping to push them out. But, you know, it's it's a system that is just, I, I you know, I, I worry. It, it's <coughs> broken in so many ways. And, you know, we, we've tried police reform. There's been community policing. There's been all these, these different approaches to policing. And we still get people dying. And unfortunately, you know, the data shows it's mostly, you know, black people. And all the data, I mean, you know, we, we don't need to throw data at this anymore. <laughs> It's we need to do something more concrete that is actually going to create change, and I'll let Terry take it from there. <laughs> Tari, sorry. Uh, I think you know, as the author of a report on defunding the police, you can imagine what my response will be. Um, but I'd I'd rather flip the question: What does policing do well? Right, like if we were to sit down and we were to develop a system that was systematically designed to brutalize black and indigenous people. Like that was the sole purpose of the system. That's what it was created for. That's what it was intended to do. How would it look any different to what contemporary policing in Canada looks like? How would it, how would it be differently shaped? How would it be differently designed? I contend it would not be any different because the police don't really do anything else with the kind of efficiency and the kind of, the kind of efficacy that they do brutalize those communities, right? Uh, the clearance rate for crimes in Montreal has been steadily decreasing, right? It's less than, I think it's less than 50%. It might even be less than 40% right now. So that means, what that means is effectively, the police are 
looking at calling certain things crimes and are solving those crimes less than 50% of the time. The, yet the crime severity rate in, in Quebec is steadily decreasing, right? So what we can see quite clearly from some of the information is that there is no correlation between crime prevention or solving crime and additional police officers. And this is the case across the country. We can look in all kinds of ways at, for example, body cameras, as if body cameras would stop the use of force, but they were wearing body cameras when they murdered Tyree Nichols. And they've been wearing body cameras when they've murdered other people in the United States. And if we were in Canada and they were wearing body cameras, the footage wouldn't even be released because our privacy laws are so robust that you wouldn't even be able to access those videos, right? Like, I don't, I, <laughs> there is nothing that policing does well except for brutalize these communities. So I just don't really understand what the point is in trying to fix something that doesn't do anything other than its intended purpose. I just, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't understand what the value is. I would much rather put my energy towards building something meaningful to help keep our community members safe. And if I were to ask each one of you what makes you feel safe, I'm not sure that a person with a gun and some handcuffs would be the case. I think it would be family. I think it would be housing. I think it would be having good food to eat. I think it would be having well-lit streets. I think it would be not getting run over every time you try to cross the street, right? Like I think it would be the basic tangible things that help to build a community. So why aren't we doing that? Let's stop asking the question of whether policing can be fixed because it's not broken, it's just doing what it's supposed to do. It's doing the only thing that it does well and it's doing it with increasing efficiency. Well, I don't have a whole lot to add to what, what was just said, but I think this is tied to the first question which I was thinking about while we shifted to the second one. And that is that, you know, in the absence of an analysis of systemic discrimination, systemic racism, what you have is pathology, like the pathologization of people of African descent, also of indigenous peoples, and that's where the police come in, right? right? To contain this perceived threat, right? After people of African, the irony of course is that, you know, yeah, we t you know the, the national narrative of Canada, of Canada talks about the two founding nations, right? But, you know, if you read Hugh McLennan's The Two Solitudes, you know, up until the 1940s, early 1950s, like the language was the two founding races, right? And the English and the French, which of course excluded indigenous peoples and excluded people of African descent and other groups, right? Actually even excluded the Irish and the Scottish, more or less, right? And, <laughs> but yet, in response to this conception of race, that eclipsed the life chances of French Quebecers in the province of Quebec, right? An analysis of systemic racism towards French Quebecers was uh, developed and fostered, all right, to the point where it became common understanding that French Quebecers were an oppressed group, right? Notwithstanding the history of colonization of indigenous people. So we just park that for a second. So the irony is, of course, is that that same concept, systemic conception or understanding of racism has not been accorded to people of African descent in this province. province. Right? There's a big irony there. Mm -hmm. I just, I'd be remiss if I asked this question, though, um, given that the event of this discussion is taking place in an academic setting, for better or worse. Um, we tend to look at the US and compare ourselves, no surprise, of being in Canada, but I'd like to ask you why you think the N-word is so contentious, the use of it in an academic setting. Any volunteers? We're not pulling punches tonight. We're not, we're not pulling punches. I think that, you know, I made some comments earlier about malign actors, and I think that this is a good example of what's meant by that kind of discourse, right? So 
we can understand that there are particular words that we should not use if we do not want to dehumanize other people. We can understand there are words that certain members of certain groups get to use and other members of other groups do not get to use because they don't know those experiences, they don't know those, those perspectives, they don't know those, they, they, they're not part of that, right? We can recognize that there are things that have been written historically that we generally don't address in the similar ways anymore, right? Like, we, we do this all the time. We don't speak in Shakespearean English anymore. We, we've, we've changed our approach from that, right? Like, we don't articulate ourselves in those ways. These are not particularly difficult concepts to grasp. When we choose not to grasp those concepts, there is a reason why. It is a choice. It is a choice, and if you are making that choice, then own that, but do not hide behind the veil of ignorance and do not hide behind the veil of academic freedom. Academic freedom is not freedom from criticism. Academic freedom is not freedom from consequences. Academic freedom means that you are not going to be fired for saying something that might be quote unquote controversial. That's okay, but just don't pretend that you're doing something that you're not doing, right? Like at the end of the day, if you are making that choice, own why you are making that choice. Otherwise, make the choice not to dehumanize people. And it's a very simple choice to make. It is not complicated. It does not require a great leap of intellectual fancy or flight. Do a, a brief you know, follow-up to that, just to say that, you know, it's some people I think feel like, oh, it's just a personal choice. You know, how, it, it's not. There are things that are part of the public sphere that we have to. I mean, we we can't not. It's almost like a feigned naivete. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we we know what's going on here, and um, and you know. I, Th things evolve, right? There are things that, there. Are, I mean, I was born in 1964, you know? Um, there, there have been different terminologies over the years, and when people make those changes, it's important to pay attention to it, because it's empowering when people ha are able to, to be able to name themselves, right, versus being defined by another group. And so it's, it's, I think that's why, it's a, it, to me, it's a sign of respect. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I, I do my best to you know, learn people's names, right? Things like that, to be able to say them properly. All these things, you know, uh, are signs of respect. And so I'll leave it at that. Like to add something, David, or shall I move on? It's been well said already. I, I mean, the only thing I would add is it's a reflection of the hierarchy of humanity that we still live with, despite the fact that we say slavery is, is done and that colonization ended at whatever point, depending on which colonial context you came from. Right? We still live with this hierarchy of humanity because we all know very well that there are certain forms of you know, insults or names that we cannot, if we were to use them in relation to various other groups, they would not be accepted, right? So what is it about the dehumanization of people of African descent in relation to that word, right? And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Well, it's not funny, actually, but it is a story. So when my daughter was in high school, the school instituted a policy that nobody could use the word in school. My daughter and her friends were having a conversation amongst themselves. Right? And black folks use the word because we're entitled to use the word if we, if we make that choice, which is very different from being insulted with that word. I still maintain that. The first person that was suspended in the school for using the word was a black student. So it just shows you the ridiculous nature of the, of the whole thing in that sense, right? So, you know, I think, again, it, it, it reflects a certain hierarchy of humanity and also a lack of understanding of the structures of power that we've been talking about. You've all raised the point about moves to innocence, um, and also, David, you were mentioning earlier about the national narrative. Um, it comes as no surprise that uh, the education or the curriculum um, in all provinces is lacking as far as discussion of 
the contributions and achievements of people from marginalized groups, hence why they are still marginalized. Um, I'd like to ask all of you to perhaps comment on how this, these omissions in the curriculum have affected uh, black and white solidarities. Um, you know, there's a problem of invisibility and erasure. And when I was growing up, you know, all we learned about, we learned nothing about Africa. <laughs> you know, we learned very little about African Americans. I remember, I can remember being in elementary school and, you know, I was an avid reader, so I'd go into the library and find every book I could on African Americans. You know, Jackie Robinson and Hank Aaron and, and uh, MLK, you know, all so you know, I did a lot of reading on my own, but I didn't learn a thing <laughs> in elementary school about um, African Americans, and um, knew almost nothing about Africa. Um, and so, you know, one of the the problems in our both of our educational systems is that we erase huge parts of the world. I mean, even the maps we use, you know, Africa is teeny tiny compared to its real size. Um, so I think it's important to under, you know, and you know, I, I taught a class on, well, I taught two classes last year, one on comparative immigration politics and then a higher level class on um, you know, transatlantic immigration and race politics. And so many of my students, you know, we talk about, we I talk a lot about history, even though I'm a political scientist. <laughs> history is important. Um, and so many of my students, I never knew, you know, I can't tell you how many of my parent, students came up to me and said, it, this is Canadian history, and these are Canadian students coming and telling me I, they didn't even own, know their own country's history on some of these topics. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it, it, it comes back to, you know, what we were saying about, you know, some people do not have the knowledge to know that they shouldn't use the, the N-word. And um, some people, you know, do not have the knowledge that, you know, about systemic racism because they aren't learning about it. <laughs> and so we have to, you know, we, uh, you know, have to teach them about it in our classrooms. We have to, you know, bring people, you know, I write my book, Radical Empathy and Roots of Racism to, you know, hopefully get to a broader audience and bring people up to speed on these things. But, you know, it's, it's again comes back to, you know, the project of capitalism and, and white supremacy, which is to, which is why you're seeing so many, um, not just in the U.S., right here in Canada, governments saying, oh, we need to get rid of, you know, critical race theory, which they don't, they can't even define for you. <laughs> and, you know, every, I, I had to comment to the CBC about the use of the term woke, you know, oh, wokeism. It's like, wh what are you talking about? Do you even know what you're talking about? No, I mean, hopefully people want to be aw aw awakened and woke, you know? I mean, why would you want to sleepwalk through life? But that's what they want, is people to sleepwalk through life and not pay attention. Oh, don't, don't look over here and watch and see what we're doing, you know? So it's all diversionary tactics. And you know, not educating students because you know it's about power in the end. Yeah, I would just add on to that. You know, one of the things that I, I think about when I'm educating my students. Well, firstly, I'm, I want to pick up on the critical race theory point. I wish Derek Bell was taught in more <laughs> classrooms. Like, can, 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 we, can we see the high schools where, where we're teaching Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw? Because I, I, I'd, like, I'd like those schools to exist. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not there right now. Maybe we can get there one day. Who knows? Let's see. Um, but I think that in all seriousness, Part of your question was to do is how, how does this lack of education undermine black and white solidarity? And I, I would move to kind of multiracial, multiethnic, and multi-class solidarity to understand that there's a history that is continually not being told, right? And that is not just of black folks standing up for themselves, seeking liberation and fighting for that on that terrain, building new worlds, but also of white folks refusing whiteness and standing alongside them, right? Like that history is also not told. There are so many different stories that we can pull from across our various 
contexts, across our various communities, of people going and doing incredible things, refusing to submit to, 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 to the kind of standard do, uh, processes of domination and power, right? And so if we refuse those possibilities, then we refuse perhaps the possibility of maybe building a better world. And I think that that is the consequence, right? That is part of this story too. It is not simply black folks get angry and then they go and protest and then like things change magically. Great, cool. No, there, there is a deeper process of organization and of collaboration and of coalition across contested terrain. And it's not always easy and it's not always fun, but it is meaningful. And that history also must be taught, right? And if we do not teach it, then we know what we get, right? We get these static, blocky, unhuman forms of what we could call a history. Yeah, I, I would just say that I think the world operates at a deficit and is a poorer place when it does not entertain the ideas, history, and experience of people of African descent in this world. Without the thought of France Fanon, Amy Césaire, and Edouard Glissant, even in the Quebec context, and the profound role that they played as part of a dialogue with French Quebecers, as French Quebecers were thinking about their own form of freedom. These are three people from the island of Martinique, right? Quebec would be a poor place and in a deficit without that, without understanding the history of anti-colonial struggles and the ideas of Fanon, uh, Amicar Cabral, again here in Quebec and in other parts of the world, the world would be at a deficit. You know, without thinking about abolition, the abolition movement, and the struggle for human freedom of people of African descent, which has always served as a litmus test for freedom in general, right? Look at the civil rights and black power movement, its influence on a global scale, right? So, you know, and we're talking about ideas, we're talking about thinkers, we're talking about social movements, and we're talking about the most fundamental idea that we can entertain and think about is the idea of freedom, right? People of African descent, because of the experience of unfreedom, have been at the forefront of that struggle, alongside other people, right? We can think about the, the struggle for, the Vietnamese struggle for liberation, indigenous struggles, etc. right? So I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be exclusive, but Black folks have played a fundamental role in thinking about human possibilities. And the absence of a conversation of that inside the classroom puts the, everybody at a deficit, I would say. I follow up on that just to say that it also impacts gender and the LGBTQ plus space, right? So it's, you know, it's about human rights. And when we, um, you know, it, when rights are, you know, improved, you know, we, we see that change. I mean, when in the 1960s, when the Civil Rights Acts were passed in the US, gender rode along with it, and women, you know, uh, gained from the uh, ac actions of the, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and, you know, when indigenous uh, activists uh, in the US were, you know, uh, protesting at places like, um, uh, Gosh, now I'm going to forget the island in San Francisco Bay. <laughs> Alcatraz, thank you. That's my that's my almost 60 year old brain going. But um, you know, when it it we all have a you know we all benefit from those struggles in various ways, and so that's why it's important to emphasize that we need to, the, everybody needs to learn this history because we can see how we can work together and. You know, one of the things I, I'm become you know more interested in learning about is the broader transnational, trans-African you know diaspora movements and the ways those have been undermined, um, and why we don't have a really strong you know movement to date. And I, I'm you know was very impressed with uh, our colleague Wendell um, Ajete's uh, book was just launched, and you know learning about that history and how these movements were undermined is so important to understanding why we're at where we are today. Uh, so I, yeah, I strongly encourage, and I'm gonna forget the name of the book, but um, uh, you know, it just came out and I, I think it's, I haven't actually had a chance to read it, but I saw him present on it. And I think learning that kind of history 
um, is important for all of us to understand how we, like uh, Tari was saying, we, there have been these movements in the past that where people came together and worked across national boundaries and you know really tried to create a presence that could overcome a lot of the struggles that we are still dealing with today. One more question, um, but jumping off of that, uh, Terry, could all of you tell me a bit more about how um, in your own lives you came to encounter, well, counter narratives really? I mean, how did you get involved in your work? I, I think David has a story. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it justice. No. Hmm. Um, I think in I think in my case it it begins in my home. Uh, so I don't have the same accent as Tari, but we're born in the same place. And I spent the first ten years of my life in England, in London, England, South London, England, uh, very close to a place called Brixton, which was basically like the you know, the, the, the hub of the black and Caribbean community. In terms of politics, which I wasn't as aware of at the time, but in terms of culture, and this is important things, I was thinking about my, my old dear late friend, Richard Eiden, and his work in search of the black fantastic, which is about politics and pop, popular culture in the post-civil rights era. And the way he talks about music and the transnational nature of music, how it's porous, crosses borders, and has infused people's lives aesthetically, culturally, politically in ways that we often don't account for, and especially the political part. And that has been true in the absence of other opportunities in other spheres of life. You know, so visiting Brixton and just the streets were alive, and the sounds of Caribbean voices and the sounds of those kind of black British accents and the music coming out of record shops, right? That was a formative part of my life and obviously just listening to the music itself, you know. You know Ken Booth, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh. Um, like, that was profoundly important for me. Um, you know, political discussions at home, you know, growing up in a context in which the National Front under Margaret Thatch Thatcher, and I'm making a direct connection between the two of them, although they're not, yeah, 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 well, yeah, there's a, there's a connection to be. But anyway, um, you know, knowing that there were places in England, if you were black, Indian, or Pakistani, if you walked and ventured into that area, you could lose your life because of the National Front, right? But then also growing up on an estate, which is a, a fancy word that the English, the British use for some strange use and pro reason for a project. So growing up alongside poor white folks, right? And, uh, and thinking about the dynamics of race and class alongside each other. I'm not saying I was consciously thinking about those things as a child, but I realized that I carried those things with me as I, as I, as I, got older, and there were always political conversations in my house about all kinds of things in the house that I grew up with. And, you know, I grew up also knowing my grandfather, that my, you know, my grandfather was um, both a Garveyite and a communist, right? Two, two nationalism and socialism, two things that are supposed to be mutually exclusive and incompatible, right? Um, but as far as people of African descent have been historically, as has not historically been the case, right? Right, because um, that, those were two vehicles through which black folks could engage and think about freedom in the absence of other, possi uh, other possibilities. So um, the other thing I would say is, you know, growing up between Montreal and Toronto after leaving England, in Toronto, third world bookstore, Books and Crafts on Bathurst Street, near Bathurst and Bloor, was for me, my generation, and for other folks, just profoundly insignificant in terms of discovering books by would be Malcolm X, Bell Hooks, um, C.L.R. James, Franz Fanon, Walter Rodney. And, and this is while I was in high school, so I was very fortunate in that sense. And I'll just add one other thing, is that in high school I played a lot of basketball, um, very competitively, on a, you know, both for my high school team and also a league team, what would they call AAU today, they used to travel you know, in other parts of Canada and the United States. And just watching the dynamics of athletics and black athletes, and how me and many of my peers were channeled into that direction at the expense of other areas, right? And how 
many of my, my friends did not escape that. And when their sports eligibility was up, right, and they had not graduated, their life went in other, their lives went in other directions. That was, you know, profoundly important for me because there's always this conversation about sports being a vehicle, right? But it's really for a fraction of people, right? And what's left behind when when folks are channeled in that direction is, you know, often not pleasant. I would say. So, yeah, that I would say in large part. I mean. Moving to Montreal, where I lived for the first two years after England, was also important, just in terms of like seeing the dynamics in terms of, you know, this is post the first referendum, you know, but there were still these very strong, especially in Pierrefonds, West Island, very strong Anglo dynamics, right? Which, you know, you know it's complicated, because we have to have some sympathy, you know, for the history of French Quebecers in this province and in this country, right? And and be able to be and also have like the, enough complexity to understand the history of colonization, right? And that these two things can coexist, right? Being oppressed and colonized in a certain sense, and being a colonizer, right? And then thinking about what that means in a context in which like French Quebecers in the province of Quebec are hegemonic. Right, so it's complicated and there's a degree of fluidity to it. And you know, I became attuned to that when I was quite young, um, just seeing the different roles that Anglophones and Francophones still in those days played uh, in various sectors of society. Thanks, uh, David. I, I share certainly the first part. I just moved to Montreal a few months ago, so I don't have the second part, but certainly for me, um, I'm thinking about how I became engaged in politics, and similarly, it was through music and through exposure in the home. So, my, you know, my dad slipped me a copy of Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Masks at the age of like 12. And I don't know why he did that, but he did. Um, and so I read it, and I didn't understand a lot of it, but I ended up understanding a lot of it. Um, the other, When we're thinking about music, it's funny because when you grow up with uh, with parents that listen to, for example, right, that like my dad has like Wu Tang, <laughs> like mixtapes on like cassettes in the car or whatever. When you're a teenager, you seek to rebel, and how do you rebel when your parents are listening to rebel music? And so the way that you do that for me was listening to punk rock. So I ended up listening to a lot of punk rock, and I heard that people were really angry, and they were angry, and they felt really righteous, and I couldn't really identify fully with why they were angry. And so my dad, trying to relate to me, slipped me a Bad Brains record. And then I was like, huh, okay, cool, I can get with this. And what, what it did is the music helped to catalyze my politics. It helped to give me an ethic and a grounding and a way to start thinking, broadly speaking, about who I was and what my identity was and what it could be um, and how that was related to not only my racial identity, but also to the struggles of those that have gone before me across diaspora. And so that helped to catalyze my interest, helped to catalyze my learning, and also helped me to have a fundamental value system, right? Like I, I, the values that I adhere to and that I believe in are grounded partially in that rebellious music, for good or for ill, right? And so that's, that's a big part of who I am, and, and I hold on to that. Well, my dad was in the military when I was growing up in the U.S., and he wasn't particularly political, although, you know, he was doing his bit in his own way. Um, but my political awakening was mo more revolved around, I mean, I was a political junkie from the get-go. I mean, when I was growing up, the TV news was on all the time, you know, and two women had a huge impact on my thinking around when I was, you know, basically elementary, junior high, you know, Shirley Chisholm, Ch I will mention Shirley Chisholm and uh, Barbara Jordan. Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman to enter Congress. Um, and uh, Barbara Jordan uh, was just incredible, w was a congresswoman when in, during the Watergate, uh, tri uh, or sure, the Watergate hearings, I should say. And, um, you know, I always remember her speech at the, uh, Democratic National Convention, and 
you know, so that's where representation for me was so important, to actually see two really strong black women um, who were part of the political system, you know, gave me hope that I could someday, you know, do something in that realm. And, you know, even though my parents weren't particularly political, they didn't, you know, they encouraged me to, to read, to, to, you know, my, my sisters were involved. I remember one of my, one of my first memories is walking around with my sisters um, uh, campaigning for George McGovern, <laughs> which wasn't, uh, you know, Spokane was a very working class, so it was tended to go democratic, but later would shift to be more conservative. Um, you know, but, you know, my political awakening really was driven in many ways by, you know, the whole idea of feminism and what black, you know, I was having this discussion with a colleague uh, this afternoon, just, say, you know, I was talking with another colleague about black feminism and so on. I'm like, well, you know, I came up in the era when a lot of the, you know, people we look at as black feminists were just getting started. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, when I say who influenced me, I don't necessarily think of them because that they, they're my contemporaries. They were out there doing that work um, and writing those books and those articles at a time when I was, you know, going through my education and, and learning all these things. So I think it's there's this generational thing that happens when, you know, I think about who my influences are. It's, you know, the trailblazers. It's, you know, I was one of the, I mean, every position I've been in, just about, I'm the first black woman, or, or I'm the first woman, or I'm the first black person. So, you know, we're a generation that has been, you know, the first. And so, you know, it, it's, very empowering to be part of this wave, you know, that goes back, you know, many years. You know, a lot of women in the civil rights movement are only now, you know, really being recognized for all the work they were doing. Um, and so I think um, for me, I would say my, you know, my political awakening is an ongoing thing. Um, it's showing up in my writing. It's showing up in the way I teach. And, you know, we have to be prepared to be constantly updating, constantly thinking about ways we can, you know, change the way we do things to make it um, a better situation for our students, for, for, my, for my own boys. Um, you know, I, I constantly think about the fact that, you know, they're, they're both in college now and out in the world. And, you know, I have to think about ways that I can help you know, them to, to manage. And, and I wanted to come back to, to David's point about climate change because, first of all, we're part of the global minor majority, rather. And the global majority is going to be more devastatingly impacted by climate change than any other group. And, you know, that's why it's a part of, it has to become a part of our approach to um, this work in general. And I'll Thank you very much. So we'll be taking questions now. Um, are we passing a microphone around? Or? Okay. Do you want to question for you? you want, there's, there's a microphone just here. Right. So if, if you have a question, uh, we'd invite you to just step to the microphone and line up. Any questions? Hi. Thank you. As a contemporary of Terry, I'll be a first uh, as well, uh, or older than Terry. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion. I was, uh, I can't remember now, I think it was Terry used the word veil, and it made me think of W.B. Du Bois and this notion of uh, double consciousness and the veil that um, we live in, in when we think about race. And I was having a discussion last night about the question whether in fact that whole concept reifies or confirms a racial identity that the black community embraces itself. And how do we actually step beyond this concept of race? So we've had 
Ibram X. Kendi talking about anti-racism, we have the concept of radical empathy, and yet we keep coming back to this concept of an artificially construct, it's an artificially constructed concept of race. How do we take the conversation beyond that? And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that, particularly here in this context that we've been describing. Thank you. I think it's important to acknowledge that while race is a social construct, we all live with its implications. <coughs> and that, uh, so the name Nicker Spring was mentioned earlier. And this is a young man, 21 years of age, who was arrested under what might be unusual circumstances, first of all, um, was detained, Bordeaux prison, was arraigned and was, uh, the judge said that this young man should be released and he was detained illegally. And it's within that context that he was pepper sprayed, uh, spit mask was placed, placed over his head he was pepper sprayed some more, thrown in a shower, and maybe pepper sprayed a third time, and then thrown in a cell. And that's how he died, like, just like that. Right? So this concept of race is a construct for sure, but the lived experience of racism is real. So until we deal with the structural forms of inequality and the structural forms of power that reproduce behaviors that can lead to what happened to Nika Spring, right? we can't, and I don't, I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but we can't sort of theorize our way beyond that reality because it's, it's real. You know, just like the rates of incarceration, which is tied to the pathologization of black folks that we mentioned earlier, is real. Just like the racial codes that eclipse black life chances are, 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 are real in every sector of society, right? And um, so the struggle is to get beyond a world of unfreedom, right? And that means dealing with structural forms of power of which systemic racism is a crucial ingredient. And we're, we're very far from that place. And every time we think we've learned some kind of lesson from a previous incident, right, there's another one that comes that reminds us of precisely where we are. I would just add to that, that if you look at the situation with inequality and how it's growing, um, that is another factor that is undermining um, you know, our ability to, to even get to a point of where we can really talk about race and racism. Um, growing inequality makes it difficult for a lot of people, you know, the vast majority of people to get past what we were talking about. People just want, you know, they want good jobs. They want to, you know, be able to eat. They want, to, you know, um, not have to worry about how they're going to pay their energy bill after this, you know, cold snap and, and so on. And, um, you know, it, it's a situation where people, you know, we need to be help. I, I talk about this in an article I read about, you know, how the, the left can write itself. We need to be talking about basic human needs and making sure when people are, in a situation where they aren't, you know, they're, you know, they can actually live their lives <laughs> without the constant worry of how they're going to get their next meal, uh, or how they're going to get, you know, pay their their bills. You know, we're not there, and we're getting farther and farther away from it. With you know, as these billionaires, you know, control the vast majority of the wealth in the world, and you know, that's a really intractable thing, but. You know, it, it undermines our best efforts to to move forward. Hi, and thank you all so much for your words today. 
Uh, for a class this week, I'm reading Professor Ronaldo Walcott's uh, book called The End of Diversity. Uh, and one of many uh, one of many things he said that has resonated with me this week is that whiteness is both people and structure. And I'm wondering if you could give your thoughts on, let's say, you know, in light of this being Black History Month and we want to talk about uh, confronting anti-black racism, uh, where do you see collective and individual action as separate, uh, as together? Uh, how can we confront how white people uh, live and breathe the benefits that uh, are innate to the lives that we were born into? How do we confront that while also uh, hopefully con confronting the structure as well? Uh, and thank you. I wrote a whole book about that. But, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of discussion about this, right? I mean, you know, I mean, Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, all these things are out there, but it really takes serious willingness to understand this stuff and to look inside and to say, yes, I am part of this. Um, and it's not easy, it's extremely difficult work. And yeah, I think Tari addressed it already to a certain extent, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to want to say, well, my parents, you know, they came over as immigrants and, you know, they, they fought and struggled and, and, you know, it wasn't easy for them. But um, it's hard to say they benefited if they were white, if they, they, they benefited from white supremacy. You know, it's, it's hard to, to make that connection, but it's real. And... Um, you know, the, the book clubs aren't going to get us there. It's really going to be a willingness to want to see a better world in a way that addresses these systemic issues in a serious and concrete way, which means actually, you know, being willing to name it, to face it. That's why they're trying to erase it, right? So I'll let my colleagues jump in as well. Yeah, I'll just hop in quickly to add that, like, I, you know, and, and this might just be my dispensation, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a doer. I like to do stuff. I like to build stuff, right? Like, so th this is kind of my dispensation, but I think a lot of ink gets spilled and a lot of tears get shed over the idea that I must, you know, internally renounce and refuse the privileges that, that are bestowed upon me as a white person and et cetera, et cetera. And, like, that's really good work and that's all well and good, but like what are you going to do? Right, like what, what, in what ways are you addressing the material concerns that exist on the ground? Are you joining, are you joining the movement somehow, right? Like are, are, you, are you contributing your time? Are you volunteering? Are you, are you like educate, like what, what is it that you intend to do? Um, and can you do things in a way that does not, number one, harm others, and number two, might decenter yourself, perhaps, from being the protagonist in that story? So can you join an organization and not feel like you have to take over that organization, but set up some tables, right? Like, can you, can you, help, to, can you help to clean up at the end of the night instead of trying to speak at the front of the organization? Like, can you, can you do some of these just basic things, right? There are plenty of organizations that just need people to do stuff and no one shows up and like maybe that's a good place to start before we even start going broader than that can we can we just get some people to like set up some tables sometimes you know what i mean uh that's what radical empathy is you know i th th i put radical in front of empathy because it means taking action don't just feel sorry you know take action and you know there's so many different things that can be done um but you already named a few so i'll leave it at So I absolutely agree that so change comes through organizing. We can't theorize or wish change away. I mean, wish, wish, wish problems away. But I, I'm also a big believer in, in framing the problem and the historical roots of the problem. Right? So that word problem is important because, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois posed the question, how does it feel to be a problem? And he was talking about the problem of being 
black, being African American, being of African descent. And he wrote those words in the moment of post in the immediate aftermath of emancipation. So in the post emancipation emancipation period, when there was a recognition that you can be emancipated but unfree. Right? And it's a reminder of the circumstances that brought people of African descent to the Americas, right? As a labor, right? And in the post-emancipation period, black folks became surplus laborers that used to produce surplus labor, right? And I'm saying that, I'm, and I'm putting it that way because, you know, structurally, the society that we live in is not designed that every, so that everybody can be employed and that everybody can be included. That's a myth, right? It just so happens that we are disproportionately, disproportionately amongst those who are excluded, right? But poor white folks are excluded too. A whole range of people are excluded, right? So unless we're serious about structural change, right, the kinds, the structures that reproduce forms of inequality, we'll talk about EDI, and other forms of, you know, I don't want to say cosmetic, I'm not trying to be dismissive, right? But we won't get to the core of the problem, right? We talk about the environment and we pretend as though it's not tied to the sort of economic system that reproduces waste, you know, has people living beside dump sites where there are toxic waste in, in Nova Scotia and other places, right? right? This is like a real consequence of unequal economic practices. And our presence and labor has been a central part of that, of, that, of, of that equation. So I think until we, you know, organizing is profoundly important because that's how change comes about. But we have to be clear about what we're organizing for and in relation to what. Right. Mm -hmm. One more thing, because uh, as you were talking, I was thinking our very existence creates cognitive dissonance. Right, because here we are, professors, very well educated, and yet you know we can walk into a room and somebody might think we're the wait staff, or you know how many times you know have we we walk when you you're in a space and people, oh you know you're a professor at McGill you know that it's like a surprise, and you know that that's one thing that uh, I know so many of my colleagues who are African American have experienced or African Canadian. And you know we have to get past that cognitive dissonance. That um, you know, yes, I, you know we can be, we are here. We you know it's it's a form of again erasure, right? That we can only see this group of people in a particular way, in, in as servants or as you know, mm -hmm. and so you know it, it just struck me as we were talking. You know, just our, our very existence is a challenge and in some ways a threat. I just wanted to hop off of what you said, David, because I think that that's profoundly important, right? Like that so much of contemporary organizing and, you know, I, like I said, I'm a doer, I like to do things, but so much of contemporary organizing, um, not so much of it, quite a bit of it can be without analysis and without being paired with a kind of principled ethic that's rooted in a long history, right? So if you look back into the 1960s and 1970s, people would go out to actions, they would also read, right? Like that was, that was part and parcel of what you were supposed to do, right? And so just to, just to add on to your point that like we have to understand why and we gain that understanding through reading, through reading deeply, through reading closely, through reading in community, right? And like through engaging in that way as well. And so it's not to disparage or dispel the idea that we might garner information, garner an understanding of history. It's that that has to be paired with the action. So that's the praxis piece that's so important. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I backed you off on that point as well. And I, yeah, and I just, and, and, and to what end too, right? So what kind of world? So to go back to the point that, that Terry just made is, so being mistaken for a janitor or a cleaner or a servant is one thing. But ideally, we, we're working towards a world where that distinction is not important, 
right? That's the struggle. And that's where we're very far from, I think. All labor is valued, right? That, you know, it's not, it's not to demean in any way because I, you know, I come from, you know, we all, you know, come from somewhere. And, you know, my grandfather was a sharecropper. Both of my grandfathers were sharecroppers. And, you know, but it's about the opportunity. It's about having, you know, the ability to honor all, ki all forms of labor. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, because it's tied to your, 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 what you just said, Terry, but also to the question about um, like influences and socialization. So as far as I can remember, and this is almost going to sound like a stereotype of Caribbean women, my mother has always worked three jobs. You know, and that was in England. And when she came here, she came here as a living caregiver working, looking after other people's children and cleaning their homes, right? I watch my mother not sleep, work night shifts, work day shifts, and that's left an indelible imprint on my mind. Yeah, you could say some in some ways in terms of like work ethic and maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia, but on a deeper level, it's a reminder of just how the world is divided, right? There are some people that have leisure time because they can afford to hire somebody to work in their homes, right? And there are the other folks who are, you know, prescribed this role of being the laborers, right? And my mother was one of those, those laborers, right? I think my, 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 both my grandmothers, my, my grandmother was my second mother who raised me partly for part of my life in England, right? You know, laboring behind the singer sewing machine that Amy Cesare talks about in his famous poem, um, return to my native country, right? Like, piecemeal work, you know? Um, so, you know, all of those things, I think, for me, have been reminders of, like, the nature of the world that we live in and the allotted roles that different groups of people have. Hi, uh, my name is Madison. I'm a student journalist at the McGill Tribune. Thank you all so much for being here today. It's been an absolutely amazing uh, event. So my question is, you discussed how representation in staff, students, faculty at McGill, um, obviously there needs to be way more black professors and way more black students in McGill than there currently are, but EDI does not equal freedom, as you rightly said. So what are structural changes that like really convey long-term transformation that you think should be implemented at McGill like immediately? At McGill immediately. <laughs> or, or in the long term, both are, both are good. I'll, yeah, well, I, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's why I'm at McGill. I mean, we're doing it, some of it right now, but it's a process, right? So we're bringing in the black faculty, but I was just, again, I, I have these conversations all the time. I mean, part of it you know, was brought up at our Black History Month um, talk last night by Ronaldo Walcott, is the, you know, is as we bring the, fa it's not just about representation, it's about um, a form of knowledge. So, my writing about political, you know, I, I think about this a lot because, I mean, it's the reason I wrote my book, The Roots of Racism, because I have, I am bringing in a, a, a way of approaching the knowledge around political science that is different from my white colleagues because I am looking at it through a particular lens that says this history matters. You know, we can't be objective as political scientists. We come at it from a particular lens. And the lens I look at is a more historical lens, is a lens that says that you can't study voting behavior without understanding the underlying systemic racism. You can't study legislatures without understanding the, I mean, you know, anyway, I could go on and on and on. I wrote a whole book about it. But I mean, it it's, comes back to, you know, looking at knowledge in different ways ways, and that's not just from the black perspective, it's from an indigenous perspective, it's about ways we teach, it's about um, 
decolonizing not just the, the syllabus, but the way we think about our disciplines. Um, I'm, you know, I'm constantly calling my discipline to task for not being more historical, for not thinking about the impact of years and, and, and centuries of colonial thinking. Um, and you know, it, it's interesting to come in, you know, as an immigrant to Canada and as a settler myself. I am on land that has not been ceded. And so, you know, it's about reimagining the ways we approach knowledge that has to change along with the representation. Last word. Oh, my. Oh, whoops. Um, I would just add on to that to say that, like, it's about what the students value. The students, at the end of the day, and I'm talking specific, I, I'm talking about all students, I'm talking specifically about black students. Do they feel like they enjoy their university experience? Does it grow them? Does it allow them to imagine a different future? They are the people that do the cool stuff. I like students because they're the ones that are pushing me forward. I'm not pushing them forward. I'm exposing them to what I know, but what I know is profoundly limited compared to what I do not know. And the students bring so much all the time. They're so inquisitive, they're so knowledgeable, they're so grounded, and they're so able, right? And this is, this is what matters. So it is their, their experience that matters. What they feel, how they experience this space matters. And to me, I could, I could be having a really bad day or a really bad week or whatever. If the students are supported, that is something meaningful and substantive. It will change this university. I don't know what the university was before. I wasn't here, but I can, I can speak to who the students are, at least the ones that I've met, and that's something that is very true for me. David. Yeah, I would just add that. So, first of all, I've had some fantastic students, and some of them are actually here today. A few of them are, are here. <laughs> Three or four of them are here. Um, like really, and that's been a privilege. It is a privilege. I think teaching is a privilege. I think being able to teach what you enjoy teaching and learning from your students as you're teaching it is, is a, a real privilege. But the students that are attracted to the courses that I teach, whether it's here or in the college where I teach, which by the way, trains police officers and prison officers, um, who I often have in my classes. Um, but the students that are attracted to the courses that I teach here are attracted to the courses that I teach here. That sounds redundant, right? So what does that mean for those who are not? So you can have as many professors of African descent or professors who are teaching critical material of one form or another inside the classroom, but if the option is to, 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 to check out, well then, then what am I, I'm making an argument for general education in the way that it exists in the colleges and the stage ups here, right? Because most students are not going to be in the courses that uh, however many black professors and other, other kinds of professors are teaching. It's just not gonna be the case, right? So, so at the end of the day, it's not quite preaching to the converted because we're always in this process of learning, but it does mean that the vast majority of students are not gonna be exposed to what's being taught in the classroom, right? So, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's an issue there, right? There, there's, a, there's a major issue there in terms of who's entering that classroom or those classrooms. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but thank you again to our speakers for this really rich discussion, and I'll pass it on to Daniel Bellon. <laughs> Thank you very much to uh, Holly. Of course, you did a great job, uh, uh, truly professional. Uh, uh, and yes, absolutely. And our panelist, David Terry, who actually gave a guest lecture in my class today. Uh, I think in the spirit of what David said about, you know, also exposing more students to, um, 
uh, to these uh, discussions about, about race, even if they don't take a class on the topic per se. And of course, uh, uh, Terry, my friend Terry, um, and you all my friends. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy also to see so many friends and people here uh, today uh, because it w it's an important topic and it's not going away. Um, and I think it was very insightful um, to have this discussion. As for those who are waiting in line to ask questions, don't worry. There is a reception coming. Just afterwards, you can eat, drink, and ask your questions directly to the speakers if you want to. Um, uh, so before we end this, and because I'm now standing between you and the reception, so I will go fast, I want to let you know that uh, we have two upcoming online webinars uh, later this month at MISC on February 23rd at 4 p.m. Uh, Stephanie Carvin will be giving a talk about the far right in Canada, which is very topical when we talk about racism, actually. And the day after, on February 24th at noon, Maria Popova, uh, who is a faculty in our department uh, in political science at McGill, will be giving a talk on the, the first anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and will focus on the relationship between Canada uh, and Ukraine and Canadian foreign policy in that context. I hope you can join us, of course. That will be both events online. Uh, to find more about our other events, because we'll have more events, uh, of course, in, uh, later in March and then in the spring, um, and to learn more about the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, you can visit our website at mcgill.ca slash misc, M-I-S-C. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. And uh, we are also on Facebook and Twitter. And on Twitter, it's... Uh, MISCAN, M-I-S-C-C-A-N. So you, if you're on Twitter, you should follow MISC. Huh? That's great uh, to learn about our events. Um, and also other events on campus, we, we promote them as well. Um, finally, uh, well, it's time to drink, to chat, and to think critically and getting, bringing people together uh, from different backgrounds in this context uh, is also a mission of our institute. And we are really glad to participate in Black History Month, as we have done over the last few years and as we plan to do moving forward. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée. À la prochaine. Bye-bye. Thank you again. <laughs>